Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Johnny Vlogs. And we have a huge list of Patreon supporters I have to go through. Today's episode of Johnny Vlogs brought to you by Donna Penueta, WKC, Casey Jane edited her pledge and upped it. Thank you so much. And as a matter of fact, today's topic is coming to you from a suggestion from Casey Jane. Carol Warren, Donna Wolf. Uh, edited her pledge. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, Chris Kolba, Travis Allen, Angelica Gonzalez, and A. Armstrong. This list is huge. Thank you guys so much for the support. It means so, so much to me. Um, I truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you to each and every one of you Patreon supporters. Now, to Casey Jane's suggestions. She sent me a tweet asking about predictive programming. So I looked into this a bit today and I gotta tell you guys in the end, I'm pretty confused. I really don't know which way to go with this. So let's jump into it a little bit. Um, and first of all, part of the problem that I have with it is really trying to understand the conditions of what predictive programming are. So I've got two websites in particular. Um, one of them is fairly critical of it. The other one is kind of minorly critical, but they're a little more open-minded. So we're gonna start there with their explanation. This is from a website called thecoincidencetheorist.com. What is predictive programming? Pred predictive programming, a theorized method of mass mind control proposes that people are conditioned through works of fiction to accept planned future scenarios. Researcher Alan Watt defines this phenomenon as the power of suggestion using the media of fiction to create a desired outcome. Repeatedly exposing the public to the same specific themes should wear them down into a state of passive acceptance. By the time said changes start to manifest in reality, Few will even think to question the developments, let alone re rebel against them. Now already, as we go into that statement, there are pieces of it that I don't know that I agree with necessarily. Um, showing someone a preconditioned outcome. For example, one of the theories is that we've had so much media about aliens coming to Earth because the government is trying to prepare us for aliens actually coming to Earth. Um, now, if you look at the media, uh, you know, films like Independence Day and things like that, those aren't great outcomes. Um, is it really going to make me uh, more calm as a person if aliens show up, if I've been conditioned to the constant story that they're going to be a threat to us, that they're going to be killing us, trying to take our resources? I don't understand um, how that would be accurate. But I do think there's something to be said about um, us being more comfortable with the thought of them existing because we've been exposed to that thought so many times. I mean, for example, if you look at Superman, Superman is an alien, but he's not of that type. He is the type that is here to help us. Um, and in its base nature, when you look at these stories, it's always about an alien coming here and us discovering that that person or that alien is an alien, I guess is the best way to say it. So is there something about desensitizing us through repetition? I do believe that that is feasible. And I don't think, um, it's weird because some of these arguments against predictive programming really go after the context significantly. Um, as a matter of fact, the paper that's a bit more critical, this is from a website called conspiracypsychology.com. Um, they have kind of five reasons why they don't think that it is accurate. Their first reason is that it conflicts with the social learning theory. Uh, the second reason is poorly defined purposes, which I, I'm kind of touching on in what I've been saying. Um, three is implausible psychological mechanisms. For example, Batman, I guess in the uh, Dark Knight film, there is a map that is shown and Sandy Hook is shown uh, on that map. And some people think that that was some type of psychological conditioning so that when the Sandy Hook massacre occurred, um, we would all just kind of uh, be at more ease about it because it showed up in a Dark Knight movie. Um, once again, to his 
point, the implausible psychological mechanism, I don't know how that mechanism would help ease what happened with Sandy Hook. Some people have the theory that the people in control have to tell us they're in control, so that's why they put that little wink in there so that the people that are very observant would know, uh-oh, look, it's the Illuminati that runs Hollywood or whoever's coordinating all this. They're once again winking at us, telling us about Sandy Hook before it actually happens. Um, to what benefit? I, I really don't understand. So I kind of, this implausible uh, psychological mechanisms argument has some strength for me. Uh, pseudoscientific underpinnings, once again, you have to understand the core reasoning for that. And this, this conspiracypsychology.com article, I'm going to put it in the description box below. I do think it's worth a read, but I think it makes some very heavy assumptions about understanding what that type of conditioning is and what it's for. Another one that frequently comes up is movies like The Hunger Games or RoboCop. They show this kind of totalitarian future where you know there's one organization that's trying to run things and they're evil and uh, there's a hero that stands up against them and they're saying by the course of that narrative that the hero standing up against them and usually winning in those films that, that means that that stuff can't be implanted it wouldn't be beneficial if it was used as a tool in predictive programming and I don't think I even necessarily agree with that um, there's something about those types of films that has always struck me yes when I was a kid uh, and I would watch a movie like that, I would imagine I was RoboCop. I would be the guy that's going to stand up and fight against that, or I was Superman, or whatever the, the main hero of the film is. But as I've gotten older, and as I've actually stood up for some things in my life, and had allies or friends with me, and noticed their reaction to many of the times not standing up with me or running away from those instances, what I've come to believe is most people are not RoboCop. Most people are not Superman. And even though you want to associate with that character, maybe when you're watching the film, I think there is a truth that might be subconscious where you actually realize, well, yeah, I would love to be Superman, but I can't be Superman because I'm not an alien, I don't have his powers, I can't be Robocop because I haven't been shot to bits and been put back together with technology and I'm not bulletproof. So I can't, even though I want to associate with those people and in the terms of me watching this piece of fantasy, I can allow myself to do that. If the reality of this world came into play here, I would more likely be that guy that's standing over on the sidewalk there or that person that's running away behind that building there. I would not be the person actually standing up there. Um, so I do think, and how many of those narratives are like that? These are not normal people typically that stand up as heroes. They have um, extra abilities or extra reasoning. Even Batman. My parents weren't murdered by a guy in an alley. Uh, so I don't have the rage that Batman has. I'm not a billionaire, so I can't make all the tools that Batman has. Even the characters that we associate with in their universe, um, if we were really to be a part of that universe, we would never be that character. So there's something about that that when I think about it in terms of this predictive programming conversation, I think should be looked at differently and maybe a bit more deeply. Um, because those narratives are essentially telling us it takes a special person to do this and you're not that special person. So it is, it is totally possible that you know, the type of themes from Logan's Run and RoboCop and Hunger Games, that those things could be conditioning us for how to act if those types of things actually came into our reality. I'm not that good of an archer, and I definitely don't look good in little tight clothes, so I'm not going to be a Katniss Everdeen. Um, I don't know. I don't know. There's something about that that, that kind of nags at me. The way both these articles um, go about predictive programming, I think they, they, they're taking it extremely literally, and to the point of, um, in particular, one of them's talking about the Dark Knight film, and that... Uh, why wouldn't it have come out? Why wouldn't someone have leaked, oh, hey, do you remember that uh, part in The Dark Knight that said Sandy Hook? Well, we were told to do that by the government. 
because you, you think of how many people it took. There was a person in the art department to make that. There was a person that was a director of photography that decided how to shoot it. There was a director that was looking over that. Um, was it written in a script? That means the writing team would have been in on this. Wouldn't one of those people have come forward and spoken out or been some type of whistleblower about that? I can tell you, if you know much about Hollywood culture, probably not. That is not a strong argument at all. People in Hollywood do not talk particularly about their business. It is a huge no-no to do so. Um, and I don't believe that people at that level, those types of foot soldiers that are making the production, would know what the reason for it was. They wouldn't need to. If you've ever worked in an organization that has multiple layers of management, uh, how many times have you been told to do something that you didn't understand? but you were told to do it specifically a certain way. Um, the people in charge don't always pass down the reasoning with the uh, commands and orders that they issue. As a matter of fact, I don't think that is very common at all. So at least for that argument that's brought up, I can't remember which article it is, um, it's not a strong argument at all. And if you consider that we have certain operations that we do know about, such as Operation Mockingbird, once again I'll have a link to the Wikipedia on this one down below. After 1953, Operation Mockingbird had major influence over 25 newspapers and wire agencies. The usual methodology was placing reports developed from intelligence provided by the CIA to witting or unwitting reporters. Those reports would then be repeated or cited by the preceding reporters, which in turn would then be cited throughout the media wire services. We already have a precedence for, uh, at least the CIA, messing with information, particularly within news media. And this was way back in 1953. Do you think that the CIA or other organizations that might be within our government have really given up on that today? And do you think that they would only use news media to do so? I'll leave that to you guys. I am really not sure. And let me give you just one other, maybe seemingly unrelated, but I see a bit of a connection here. Do any of you guys remember Joe Camel? In 1991, the Journal of the American Medical Association published a study showing that by age six, nearly as many children could correctly respond that Joe Camel was associated with cigarettes, as could respond that the Disney Channel logo was associated with Mickey Mouse, and allegedly that the Joe Camel campaign was targeting children. At that time, it was also estimated that 32.8% of all cigarettes sold illegally to underage buyers were camels, up from less than 1%. Now, this is a bit about marketing, and I am not a marketing expert, but it occurs to me that if you are going to attempt to control your population, you're going to have to reach them when they're extremely young, as they did uh, with Joe Camel, although I think the cigarette company, R.J. Reynolds, still denies that that was actually the case. Um, but they have stopped that advertising, luckily. We know Operation Mockingbird existed, so they were at least playing with the news media. But if you are talking about messages that are meant to program or condition the entire population, news media is not going to do it. News media gets a certain section of people. Um, how many kids watch the news? Not many. Uh, so I think that uh, if predictive programming is going on, it is likely going to show up. Yes, it would be in the news media, but it would also appear in pieces of fiction. And like I said, I don't think that it's going to be concise, whole messages that people could look at and say, whoa, well, they're obviously saying that because next year we're gonna go to war in this country and they're trying to get us used to that by showing us this film where we're going to war in that country. I don't think it works like that. I think it's a bit more like a magic trick, like a force in a magic trick. Um, 
if for, for those of you that don't know, a force is where you are given something that seems like a open choice to you, but in actuality it's not. For example, someone hands you a, a deck of cards that are all face down, they say take a card, and you don't realize that all the cards are the same one. Um, it's not a deck of 52 different faces that they all have the exact same card under them. There are certain things that could be made to look like decisions that really aren't. And I believe that there are certain psychological constructs that could be made of varying pieces to give us kind of an overarching view of something. Um, I don't know. See, my brain just went twisty on this. And this video is going way too long. So, but like I said, I am I, honestly at this point, I am not sure if predictive programming is real or not. I think I've stated a couple reasons to believe that some type of conditioning within media, I think, is reasonable to believe in. Um, have I seen any examples myself? Another example that comes up frequently in these articles is the pilot episode of The Lone Gunman, which was a spin off from The X Files. Apparently that plot was about um, stolen airliners that were used to knock down the Twin Towers and that it was an inside government job. And of course that pilot came out before 9-11 happened. So is, is it going to be that literal? Was that some type of message in itself? I don't know what the benefit of that would be. I don't see that there's a mastermind that Rupert Murdoch is sitting there somewhere going, <laughs> just to mess with people, I have to let them know that I'm the one actually in charge. So put that message out and then have this guy go and coordinate you know, 9-11 to happen. I don't think it's that nefarious. Is there a reason for certain agencies within our government to drive certain messages through our media to try to get us in some type of predetermined state? Um, I think just simple marketing answers that question. I think the question is yes. How serious are those systems? Are they really in play right now? Um, would they be regulated by anything? I would seriously doubt. So I have a lot of questions around that and it leaves me with my brain completely twisted. So thank you so much Casey Jean. Jane, you have twisted my brain. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to all of your feedback on this. I'm sure you guys have a lot of opinions. Um, please read through the articles I've included down below. Uh, let me know your opinions on those as well. And in particular, if we have any experts out there, maybe you have a, a bit of a, a psych background on you or something like that, I'd love to hear some, um, some more expert opinions on this as well. Because I'd really, uh, I'd like to understand this better. I think this is the first episode where I'm talking about this. Hopefully not the last, but that's up to you guys. So drop some comments on me. Thank you so much for joining me on today's Johnny Vlogs. Have a great day, everyone. Catch you on the next show on the Lord and Arch channel.